program for those of you who don't know me and today our, our talk we're very excited to be bringing you a sickle cell within the emergency department so it's going to be electric it's going to be practical we'll try to provide you uh, <laughs> with some interesting points and, and keep you guys engaged as we move forward um, so before we dive into it a big uh, big thank you to uh, Dr. Da for all his time and energy he's probably put more work into this talk than I have and his uh, sort of uh, measured tactful, constructive criticism over the last month or so. Um, a, big, uh, a big, big thank you to uh, Drs. Tupin and Tinmouth, um, who are in attendance today. I don't see Melissa quite yet, but Dr. Tinmouth is here. So thank you guys very much for your expertise and involvement in the talk. To Dr. Miller, who I haven't seen her uh, come in yet, but who is heavily involved with sickle cell patients when they come into the emergency department. And perhaps most importantly, my uh, significant other who has listened to me drone on about sickle cell for the past two weeks. Um, so these are the objectives for the talk. I had a bit of a disclaimer that I wanted to mention. So firstly, sickle cell disease is an exceedingly sort of complex uh, and, and broad topic. Uh, so we've tried to narrow it down into things that we feel are important, are relevant, or things that we could perhaps be doing better in the emergency department. In addition to that, it's a severely sort of understudied population, especially when it comes to the emergency department. So decrease your expectations. We're not going to go into any big RCTs that have been done. There's a lot of observational data, retrospective stuff, and even some qualitative studies that are mixed in. So with that being said, objectives today are going to be uh, briefly reviewing sickle cell pathophys and local epidemiology. In addition to that, we're going to focus on two main entities which we feel are, are most important. The first one is vaso-occlusive crisis, which is the most common reason these patients present to the emergency department. And number two is acute chest syndrome, who I hope we all have a sort of healthy fear, fear of, uh, and the most common reason that these, uh, these patients suffer mortality. So let's uh, dive into the exciting stuff. So epidemiology, so nationally, our estimates from last year is that approximately 5,000 Canadians suffer from sickle cell disease. Uh, on a national scale. When we look at local numbers, so we have about 150 to 200 adult patients in the Ottawa area. If we also include our CHEO cohort, uh, essentially the numbers doubled. So really when you think about it proportionally, we have about 300 to 400 sickle cell disease patients in the Ottawa area. We almost have about 10% of the national population of sickle cell patients. Um, we don't have any real up-to-date, accurate information for sickle cell patients in the emergency department, but we do have numbers from about five years ago, from 2012. And at that time, we had half the patients that we do now. So in theory, we could essentially double the numbers below. But the median number of ED visits during that year per patient was 2.3. Median number of admissions was 1.1. And the last two points really uh, point out this, this idea that there's a subset of patients of sickle cell disease patients who have very high health care utilization. So of the 99 admissions that were performed in 2012, they were for 38 patients, and number of admissions per patient ranged from, of course, 0 to 15. So this slide touches on sort of the morbidity and mortality associated with sickle cell disease. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with the morbidity associated with sickle cell disease. It's an awful illness where patients experience um, frequent acute pain, chronic pain, as well as multiple uh, sort of organ dysfunction. They suffer strokes, neurological deficits, etc. But something that stood out to me when reviewing the literature is a significant decrease in average life expectancy. So compared to the average population, these patients, their average life expectancy, uh, and these are accurate estimates that are recent, ranges from about 28 to 49 years, so significantly decreased. So everyone uh, break out your Hillroy notebooks. We're going to get into uh, some exciting <laughs> pathophys. Um, we'll try to keep this simple, but for all intents and purposes, these patients have abnormally shaped and abnormally functioning hemoglobin S molecules, which over time lead to things like hemolysis, as well as micro and macrovascular occlusion. So on the grand scale of things, it can lead to things like, of course, hemolysis, but also things like acute and chronic painful crises, as well as multiple organ, uh, sort of end organ damage, like stroke, acute chest syndrome, PE. These patients are also functionally asplenic, so they're at risk for encapsulated bacteria, sepsis, and infections. I, I swear to you, this is the most dense slide 
uh, for the whole talk. There's a couple important points and there is some sort of clinical pearls mixed in here. This is a chart from EM Clinics. Um, and the important point we wanted to communicate with this slide is the dichotomy between sickle cell disease and sickle cell trait. Okay, so if we look at the bottom, sickle cell disease really only has a small number of combinations of hemoglobin molecules that can sort of manifest uh, sickle cell disease. So one is hemoglobin S paired with a hemoglobin S gene, which is termed SS disease. Then there's SC disease, and then there's S in combination with any of those subtypes of beta thalassemia. And what you see on the right side, the, the rectangle that's on the right side, is this idea that there's varying severity of clinical manifestations for these uh, patients depending on their genotype. And it's also somewhat dependent on the concentration of hemoglobin S within their circulating volume. And this is going to be an important point that we'll touch on later in the talk. But by using things like exchange transfusion, we can decrease the concentration of hemoglobin S that's circulating within their system and minimize the risks of things like vasoocclusive pain or other complications. So all that aside, I really wanted to quickly touch on sickle cell trait. So classically, we're taught that patients with sickle cell trait are not at increased risk for things like painful crises, for things like multi-organ dysfunction, when in reality, there's a few exceptions to that rule that are important to us as eMERGE docs. So the first one is that patients with sickle cell trait when they're exposed to things like prolonged exertion or exercise, they're at increased risk for things like rhabdo, things like sudden death as well. In addition to that, at altitude or with hypoxia, they're at increased risk for things like splenic infarcts. But perhaps most importantly, whenever we see a patient in the department with a hyphema who has sickle cell trait, they're at similar risk to patients with sickle cell disease for glaucoma and increased intraocular pressure. So when you see a patient with hyphema and sickle cell trait, you should be concerned uh, and you should call ophthalmology. So let's dive into a case. So I don't have a, uh, I don't have a, a reference for this picture, but it's from Fiddy's Instagram. <laughs> I, do, I, don't know, I don't know why Fiddy was admitted to hospital or why there's so many plush animals around him or why he's so like displeased about it. <laughs> Um, but let's say, so let's say you're working an ob shift and the next chart you pick up is for a sickle cell disease patient um, known to hematology. It's a 22-year-old guy uh, and he's coming in with pain, so lower back pain. You walk in, you assess him and he says, Doc, I've been tra trying to manage the past few days at home. I've got this severe, significant lower back pain. It's my typical sickle pain. I've been trying to manage with Tylenol, NSAIDs, opioids at home, but it's just not helping, and my pain right now is nine out of 10, and I need your help. So you say, okay. Um, you do a quick physical exam, and from the foot of the bed, aside from looking a little grumpy, um, he looks like a million bucks, okay? So oftentimes, he'll pull his phone out, he's playing on his phone, he's texting, he's calling friends, he's surrounded by stuffed animals. Um, and his vitals look very reassuring. So he's not tachycardic, he's not hypertensive, as we may expect if he's in a painful crisis. So this, of course, is vasoocclusive crisis. So the classic presentation of painful crisis in sickle cell patients is lower back pain or extremity pain, which is severe, it's progressive, and it's continuous. It's classically taught that there has to be some type of physical precipitant, like an illness or an infection or an injury or something like that. When in reality, a lot of experts sort of um, condone the fact that one of the most common causes of vasoocclusive pain is just psychological stress. So there doesn't necessarily have to be a physical precipitant. Your priorities when you see this patient, of course, as you all know, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So this harkens back to the importance of their typical sickle cell pain. So if it's different, abnormal, in a different location, you should be more concerned about other entities. Once you've made the diagnosis of vasoocclusive pain, your priority should be to initiate prompt and effective analgesia. But let's take a step back to the case. So all of these things that are included on the slide, normally when we see, maybe not the stuffed animals, I know I, that sort of snowballed into a bad joke, um, but normally when we see patients within the department with these things and they're telling, that, they're telling us that they have nine out of 10 pain or 10 out of 10 pain, First thing that comes to mind is they're maybe not being forthcoming, they're maybe drug seeking. So before we dive into some of the literature behind this, 
I wanted to um, touch on the fact that it's a well-documented phenomenon for these patients that they will not mount that typical sympathomimetic or catecholinergic response to pain. So there's been multiple studies. One of them is quoted there, but they sort of match up sickle cell patients presenting with a painful episode to age match controls, and they show that with painful episodes, their heart rate and their blood pressure is not different from age match controls. So they typically do not mount that response. Now, in addition to that, these patients will often have painful episodes even starting in childhood. So they're often taught sort of behavioral techniques and distraction techniques. So instead of sitting in the bed grimacing and focusing on their pain, they'll talk with friends, they'll play on their phone, they'll play with stuffed animals, they'll try to do anything that they can to sort of distract themselves away from the pain. What confounds that even further is the fact that there's no real reliable objective way to measure their pain, so there's no lab test. Um, there is one exception to that rule, which is the concentration of hemoglobin S, which we talked about before. So effectively, when the concentration of hemoglobin S for these patients is below 30 to 40 percent, you can, in theory, effectively rule out something like a painful crisis. Now, you're probably all wondering, why don't we just order this when they come in? We only run it twice a month at TOH. So it's not available to us as eMERGE docs. It's typically just for patients who are on exchange transfusions. Um, in addition to that, markers of hemolysis like LDH, like Billy, lack sensitivity. So they might be elevated, and if they are ele elevated, it somewhat increases your chances that you're dealing with a vasoocclusive crisis. But if they're normal, it should not reassure you. So taking a step back to this ideal that uh, a lot of us may have this drug-seeking paradigm when we see these patients, this was a reasonably nice study that was published in uh, Annals of Emergency Medicine in 2013. And it was a cross-sectional survey that they collected from just under 700 emergency providers attending ASEP in 2011. And essentially what they did was the first thing that they did in these surveys is they sort of stratified providers into those who maybe felt more negatively or had negative attitudes towards sickle cell patients to those who felt more positively or had more positive attitudes toward patients. And they used a validated tool to do that. And then after that, they essentially asked them to self-report their, an their analgesic practices when it comes to treating these patients. And one of the most important and perhaps disheartening results was, as you see at the bottom, so emergency providers in the highest quartile of negative attitudes toward these patients were 20% less likely to redose opioids within the guideline recommended 30 minutes. Now, what about from a patient's perspective? So again, bear with me as we go through qualitative literature during grand rounds. Um, so this is a face-to-face -face interview study with just under 70 young adult U.S. sickle cell disease patients. And while they were conducting these interviews, essentially they focused on a few main things. They focused on, number one, why do these patients seek care? What type of barriers they normally experience or normally think of that cause them to delay their care? And in addition to that, what their typical pain is before they come to the emergency department for help. And these are the outcomes that they found. So essentially, 88%, so far and away the vast majority, wait until their pain intensity is 8.7 out of 10 or greater. So this is very significant, right? Um, in addition to that, the majority of respondents reported that they often delay seeking care because they felt that they were perceived as drug seeking. And in addition to that, there was a, uh, two or three respondents that reported that often they felt ED staff lacked knowledge to take care of them, or in some instances behaved in ways that did not encourage them to revisit the ED if warranted. So I don't want to make you guys feel bad, I don't want to make you feel down on yourselves, because I'm sure that the vast majority of you don't hold these paradigms. But overall, this is disheartening. Um, so oftentimes for these patients, pain heralds bad things, right? Pain heralds things like acute chest syndrome, PE, sepsis, stroke, et cetera, et cetera. So when they have pain, we want them to come into the department. We don't want them to feel stigmatized. In addition to that, acute painful crises can precede up to a quarter of all sickle cell deaths. So just some food for thought. So many of you are probably wondering, is this founded? Is there actually a proportion of sickle cell patients who are drug-seeking, who are, are looking for opioids when they come into the department? Now, there's multiple qualitative and quantitative studies that have been done, and admittedly, it's a hard question to answer. But the uh, 
the uh, uh, approximate number that's often quoted is about 5%. So I don't know how you guys feel about that number, if you feel it's high, if you feel it's low. I look at that and I feel that it's low. It's 1 in 20 patients. It's 5%. But let's delve a little bit deeper into this. So this is another study, uh, again, published in Annals in uh, 2012, I believe, by Aisuku et al. Um, and essentially, they looked at 230 adult sickle cell patients. It was fairly robust. So what they had them do was complete daily pain diaries, where they recorded what their pain was like on painful days, if they took opioids or not, and when they came into the emergency department. Now, really importantly, Something I wanted to mention is they excluded all patients on exchange transfusions. And this is going to become important in a couple slides. Once they collected the diary data over six months or so, they dichotomized the group into high ED utilizers and low ED utilizers, with the hypothesis that high ED utilizers are more likely to be drug seeking, are more likely to present to the emergency department to obtain opioids. And the cutoff that they use isn't necessarily arbitrary, so it's been shown in some, some literature, some research, that patients who present more or equal or more than three times to the emergency department per year are at increased risk for mortality, and oftentimes that's used as a sort of cutoff to initiate certain disease-modifying mod medications uh, for these patients. Now, what they looked at when they collected the diary data is essentially the differences in characteristic of pain crises between the low ED utilizers and high ED utilizers and opioid dosing, perhaps more importantly. So this is the results that they found. So this is the pain difference between low ED utilizers and high ED utilizers. And it was significantly different. And essentially, the conclusion they made from this, which is reasonable, is that high ED utilizers probably suffer more pain than low ED utilizers. But of course, they went a step further, and they looked at opioid use. And this is on pain days, so any day that they experience pain. And they looked at the proportion of those days that they took any dose of opioids. What they found was that for high ED utilizers, they took opioids on pain days about 62.9% of the time. For low ED utilizers, it was almost half that. All right. But now, interestingly, they went a step further, and when they controlled for mean pain levels that the patients were experiencing, regardless of whether they were low versus high ED utilizers, the difference was no longer significant. So the conclusion that they make, which I tend to agree with, is that these patients are probably taking more opioids because they're experiencing more pain. Now, admittedly, there is some limitation to the study. It was sort of self-reported diary data. It's a little more qualitative, but it does provide us insight into these patients. Now, this is arguably the most important slide of the whole talk. So if you want to have a nap, feel free after this slide. Um, so within the Ottawa area, in chatting with Dr. Tinmouth and Dr. Tupin, our hematology colleagues, there's, a prox there's about 5%, so again falling back on that 5% number, of about 10 of our 200 adult sickle cell patients who suffer from chronic pain and in the past have demonstrated some drug-seeking behaviors or some uh, sort of opioid dependency or opioid abuse. For all these patients, they are on monthly exchange transfusions to maintain their hemoglobin less than 40%. So effectively, unless they've missed that month's exchange transfusion, the likelihood of they, them coming in with an acute painful crisis secondary to vasoocclusion is effectively nil. In addition to that, the majority of these patients have chronic pain, like robust chronic pain clinic follow-up. And they each have a select order set for when they present to the emergency department with acute pain. Now, through working with Dr. Miller, who I don't believe is here today, um, we're hoping in the next month or two that we're going to institute like specific ED care plans for them and little icons that pop up on Oasis. But for the time being, when you see a sickle cell disease patient, check and see if they're on monthly exchange transfusions. And if they are, then look in their documents to see if they have chronic pain clinic follow-up to see if they have one of those protocols that's outlined. So let's take a step back and talk really quickly about investigations in vaso-occlusive crisis. So we already touched on the fact that there's no real objective laboratory marker that's available to us in the emergency department to help with their diagnosis. But I wanted to chat really quickly about the value of the retic count in the evaluation of any sort of sickle cell disease patient when they present. So when we get a CBC, 
the way to interpret it is looking at their hemoglobin and comparing it to their baseline because, of course, as most of you know, a lot of these patients are sort of chronically anemic, chronically low anemia. So you compare it to their baseline. If it's lower, which means a drop of 10 to 20, your next, um, your next step is to look at the reticulocyte count. So if they're appropriately reticking, then it's more likely that they're suffering from something like sequestration or hemolysis because their bone marrow is functioning. If their retics are low, inappropriately low, then you should be more concerned about something like an aplastic crisis, which most of us are familiar is caused by parvovirus B19 uh, and requires some supportive care for about a week and a half while they get through it. Now, you should be somewhat reassured if their hemoglobin is at baseline, but you should still ask about cardiopulmonary signs and symptoms to rule out an acute chest syndrome, but we'll chat about that a little bit later on. So let's get into the nitty-gritty, the exciting stuff, and treatment of vaso-occlusive pain when these patients present. We're fortunate enough to have two recently published guidelines. So the one on the left is a Canadian Hemoglobinopathy Association, which was published in 2015. And the one on the right is the uh, US version, the NIH, which was published in 2014. So not only is this arguably the greatest film ever made, um, but it also provides a really nice analogy of how we should be treating these patients when they come in with vaso-occlusive pain, okay? <laughs> Just like Dominic Toretto would do. So <laughs> a lot of you are, are probably wondering, a lot of you are probably curious what I mean by that. Um, so in terms of, <laughs> that's, that one sort of fell flat. Um, so in terms of recommended target triage times, um, these are the guideline recommendations for both Canadian and US. So we should be initiating parenteral opioids in these patients when they present within 30 minutes of triage or within 60 minutes of registration. In addition to that, we should be reassessing their pain every 15 to 30 minutes, and we should be considering dose escalation until their pain is controlled. And typically, they recommend an escalation of about 25% their current dose of opioid. So the question comes up, are we doing this? Are we meeting these milestones? And I'm sure most of you can probably guess the answer already. But this was a study that was published in Academic Emergency Medicine uh, by Tanabe et al. And it was published in, uh, it was recent, I think 2015 or something like that. Um, essentially, the, it was a before and after study. It was fairly robust. It was a multi-center study. And it was a bit of a QI study. So the before cohort was in centers that didn't have a sickle cell protocol that was in place. And then the after and the implementation that they um, uh, sort of made was this implementation of a sickle cell disease protocol. And for all intents and purposes, the protocol was sort of founded in this idea that they need rapid initiation of parenteral opioids with frequent reassessment. So they looked at the outcomes uh, in terms of analgesic parameters for 340 adult sickle cell patients before the QI process versus after the QI process. In terms of difference in pain, mean pain score from arrival to discharge, it's not a super exciting result, but it is significantly different. And they showed that before the implementation of a sickle cell protocol, pain improved by 3.6 out of 10. And then after implementation, pain improved by a much greater 4.1. Now, perhaps more importantly, this is what they found for time to initial analgesia when these presented. So if you recall from the guidelines, these numbers should be 60 minutes or less. So not only are these centers, and probably us, not hitting these marks, but a sickle cell protocol um, made things a little bit worse, OK? Um, now, this wasn't statistically significantly different, um, so it's not necessarily um, the fact that they imp implemented a protocol. And their explanation for these numbers was uh, a little bit convoluted, and they had multiple explanations, in including ED overcrowding. But probably the most important one that they mentioned was that a lot of these patients, the vast major majority, are under triaged. So the current guidelines recommend, the US guidelines, that essentially when these patients present to the department, they should be classified as our equivalent of a CTAS-2 when in these studies, the majority were sort of CTAS 3s, CTAS 4s. Um, let's get into some practical stuff and the treatment of vaso-occlusive crisis. So let's start with some uh, 
I guess, uh, soft and fluffy non-pharmacologic stuff. Um, so in speaking with our hematology colleagues, there's no fantastic evidence for adjuncts in terms of non-pharmacologic stuff that we, can, uh, that we can provide. But the vast majority of these patients, when they're at home, anecdotally find that heat really, really helps their pain. So they'll use things like hot water bottles, hot packs, warm blankets, things like that. And even when they go up to the floor, when they're admitted in a painful crisis, a lot of them are provided or they bring their own heat. So this is something easy that we could do in the department. After you do your physical exam, after you let them know what the plan is, just grab them a couple warm blankets and bring them to them. So let's move on to a more pharmacologic approach to pain for these patients. Both the guidelines recommend that we really should be approaching them almost as if they have cancer pain and using the WHO analgesic ladder. So starting with those foundational analgesics like Tylenol, like NSAIDs, as well as adjuncts, and then after that, initiating opioids, and like we talked about, parenteral opioids. In terms of the recommendations specific to opioids, what they recommend is either hydromorphone or morphine, and they recommend parenteral forms, and they recommend against the use of intramuscular injections because, as most of you know, sort of unreliable in terms of pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. In addition to that, importantly, they recommend against the use of Demerol. All right, which might not be surprising to a lot of you. It's not a nice medication. There's multiple interactions. But in addition to that, a lot of these patients have this sort of baseline renal dysfunction. So because of that, they're at increased risk for the accumulation of neurotoxic metabolites, which can lead to seizures and comas and things like that. Now, what should be our approach to initial dosing of opioids when patients come into the department? So this is sort of expert opinion, and this is an approach that our local hematology colleagues use. But what they recommend is you take their home dose of opioids, so what they're on every four hours or so, and essentially you double it to start, and then you convert it to a parenteral form and give that to them. On each reassessment, if their pain is not still well controlled, you can escalate by 25%. So um, I should get one of the R5s to come down here to do this because they probably know this better than I do. Uh, but in terms of this table is, is straight from Rosen's. I've only included morphine and hydromorphone in terms of the conversion from PO to parenteral. Um, but effectively what Rosen suggests and what's echoed in the literature is that when we convert PO to parenteral, essentially all you need to do is divide by five. And then it's unlikely to happen, but if you need to convert from morphine to hydromorphone, or vice versa, the factor, and it varies depending on what resource you read from four to seven, but the factor that Rosen's recommend is, is 6.5. So let's go through a quick example. So back to Fiddy coming in, he's having pain. Um, he is on four milligrams of hydromorphone at home every four hours, okay? So let's look at our equipotent doses. So he's on four milligrams. So our first step is to double that, so eight milligrams. And then we convert it to parenteral, okay, which is 1.6. So that's what you give him as an initial dose. And then on each reassessment, you consider if his pain is not still well controlled to increase by 25%. So his next dose, if his pain is not still well controlled, we can increase it to 2 milligrams. This is a quick aside uh, about hydroxyurea, okay, which is arguably sort of a, a miracle drug for these patients. Miracle drug is maybe a, a strong word. Anyway, um, so this is a summary of uh, the evidence behind the benefits associated with hydroxyurea for sickle cell disease patients. The mechanism of action is a little bit convoluted, but essentially it increases your concentration of, hemo fe of fetal hemoglobin. So it decreases the frequency and severity of all those complications you see there. And a lot of this, uh, this rec these recommendations were echoed by a Cochrane review that was published just last year. These are the current guideline recommendations, and this is taken from the U.S. guidelines. The reason I'm including this is this is arguably the vast majority of patients that we see in the emergency department. So sickle cell patients who have either three or more sickle cell-associated moderate to severe pain crises in a year should be on hydroxyurea, unless there's contraindications. And then adults with sickle cell disease who have pain that interferes with daily activities and quality of life. So arguably the vast majority that we see in the department. The reason we're bringing this up is not that we want you guys to start prescribing hydroxyurea. 
But there is this common phenomenon locally of a subset of patients who feel, for whatever reason, that hydroxyurea is a bad drug. There's either side effects associated with it or it's not effective. And for that reason, they refuse to take it, they refuse to try it. So this harkens to the importance of this teachable moment within the emergency department. So when these patients present and they're at their wit's end and they're not managing well with opioids and, and adjuncts at home, we should chat with them and say, listen, have you heard about this hydroxyurea? Have you chatted with your hematologist about it? It could decrease the frequency and severity of your painful episodes when you come into the department. And if they're interested, it's not a matter of us starting it, it's just a matter of sending a consult to their primary hematologist. So let's talk really quickly about IV fluids and O2, uh, and we'll try to, tr try to go through this fairly um, quick. So traditionally, it was always thought that all these patients should get IV fluids and should get O2. By hemodiluting them a little bit, you increase their perfusion. By giving them more oxygen, you're decreasing the proportion of sickled cells that they have in their bloodstream. When in reality, this isn't necessarily the case, okay? So there have been some evidence to show that bolusing these fluids can lead to things like congestive atelectasis and pulmonary edema, which can then lead to acute chest syndrome. So you're making a bad situation even worse. The guidelines currently recommend that we shouldn't be bolusing patients who we feel are euvolemic. We should only bolus if they're hypovolemic. And if we consider to put them on an IV maintenance fluid, the only really indication is if it's a severe crisis or if they're unable to drink or tolerate PO fluids or if they're NPO for whatever reason. So this is our sort of takeaway point for our IV fluids. So don't bolus them unless they're hypovolemic and PO fluids are preferred in mild to moderate cases. If patient is NPO or unable to tolerate PO intake, that's when you should consider starting an IV maintenance. And the same goes for oxygen. So the importance that there's never really been a study to show that oxygen supplementation improves outcomes for vasoocclusive crisis in terms of pain or resolution of pain episodes. There has, in fact, even been case series studying this and showing this strange phenomenon of oxygen-related decrease in hematopoiesis, in some cases requiring transfusion. So the guidelines currently recommend that we shouldn't be aiming for an O2 SAT of 100%, something more reasonable like 95 or even 92, some experts uh, sort of propose as, as a, a better target. So this is a quick recap of uh, approach to vaso crisis. So number one, don't worry about drug seeking, but you should check OASIS to make sure they're not in that subset of patient in that 5% who's on monthly exchange transfusions and followed up by the chronic pain clinic. If they are, they will have an acute pain protocol that you should follow. In addition to that, if you do see a patient who's not one of this known cohort and you feel as though they are exhibiting some drug-seeking behaviors, then it shouldn't affect how you treat them then and there with the in the department, but you should communicate your concerns with the primary hematologist. And just as an aside, any patient who's placed on the sickle cell disease protocol has their ROT faxed to Dr. Tinmouth's office. Of course, what we chatted about, so be fast and be furious like Dominic when you treat their pain and minimize IV fluids and supplemental O2 as well. So really quickly, because we don't have a lot of time left, we'll just chat about future directions here at the Ottawa Hospital. So as most of you know, we have a sickle cell disease protocol. The last time it was updated was some time ago, so it's, it's a little bit updated. So we do have some proposed changes that we're going to approach CPQS with in the coming month or so. These are the current exclusion criteria. Um, we feel they're reasonable, We're f we feel there's nothing really to change with that, but we will add on this caveat that if the patient is on monthly exchange transfusions and followed up by the chronic pain clinic, they shouldn't be placed on the uh, sickle cell disease protocol. In addition to that, right now, when you patient put a patient, patient on the sickle cell protocol, all comers get oxygen to aim for 100% SpO2, so we'll change this to reflect more of the guidelines. And in addition to that, we're adding a little caveat at the um, recommendation of our hematology colleagues that if they find that oxygen helps their pain or makes them more comfortable, then it's entirely reasonable to, uh, to try it. And then IV fluid, so much akin to oxygen. Uh, currently, all comers, unless they have a history of CHF, receive a bolus and then get put on an IV maintenance rate of fluids. So we're going to change this again to reflect more of the guidelines. So bolus if they're hypovolemic, 
and then PO hydration is preferred over IV maintenance. These are our current opioids. So um, I know there's a lot of text, but I want you guys to focus right on the bottom. So currently on our sickle cell protocol, Demerol is on it, Meperidine is on it right now. Uh, so we will propose that we just take this off. Um, these are a few other things. So trying to make blood work optional, adding some adjuncts, uh, and then some minor changes in the antiemetics as well, but something to perhaps keep an eye out for in the coming month or two. So back to our case. Um, oh, no, 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 no. I gave away the punchline. So... <laughs> <laughs> So let's say you're, you treated this guy effectively, you, got, you gave him warm blankets. Oh, I don't even want to say anything. <laughs> um, you go back to reassess him and you give him parenteral opioids and increase at 25% PRN. Uh, and when you go back, his pain is much better. It's like 6 or 7 out of 10. But as you probably guessed now, he's a bit short of breath. He's got a productive cough. He's got a little bit of chest pain as well. So you get worried. You put on the pulse ox and he's hypoxic now. His SpO2 is about 90%. So you order a chest x-ray and this is what it shows. Okay? So I hope that everyone's sphincters tightened a little bit and I hope that everyone has a, a healthy fear of this entity of acute chest syndrome. So it's the second most frequent reason for hospitalization in sickle cell disease and the most common cause of death the case fatality rates range from 4 to 25%. So 25%. Um, there are cases of recurrent acute chest syndrome, which eventually can lead to other complications like pulmonary hypertension, ILD, and pulmonary fibrosis. And this is a list of the etiologies in terms of most common to sort of least common. So most commonly, there is infectious agents at play. Uh, and Really, as we'll get into, there's a predominance of atypicals for these patients. And then below that, pulmonary infarction, fat embolism, PE, and some patients present and they're more so idiopathic and we can't figure out exactly what's causing it. So in terms of uh, maybe delving into this uh, etiology a little bit further, this data is abbreviated from the MAC study, which is one of the more robust cohorts uh, in terms of acute chest syndrome that we have data on. And this breaks up the etiology according to causes, but it also breaks down what organism may have caused their infection. So the take-home point for this is that fat embolism, yes, infarction is included there. But you see that there's a predominance, at least in adult patients, of chlamydia, of mycoplasma, and legionella as well, and then encapsulated organisms, so strep pneumo, which as we all know, because they're functionally asplenic, they're at risk for infections with encapsulated. So when should we worry about acute chest syndrome? What causes us to get an SpO2 monitor, get a chest x-ray? Well, really, what the guidelines recommend is essentially if they present with signs and symptoms of pneumonia and they have history of sickle cell disease. Um, those are some, uh, some things to look out for, and they don't necessarily have to have fever. But let's delve in again to what the literature shows us. So again, this is the MAX data on the right and the uh, CSSCD data in the middle. So CSSCD is another cohort of sickle cell patients from sort of the early 90s or um, late 90s, early 2000s that included up to 1,700 episodes of acute chest syndrome. But it provides us good insight into what are the major symptoms and signs and laboratory abnormalities to look for for these patients. So as you see, the vast majority of patients will present with fever, cough, chest pain, tachypnea. And down at the bottom, the majority of patients will have adventitia on long auscultation. They'll be hypoxic, and they mount a fairly impressive leukocytosis for white count as well. So this is a little bit of a plug for PE. Maybe not a plug for PE, but like a, <laughs> a big, I'm all about PE. So the importance of the fact that many of these patients will have some type of clot or PE within their lungs when they present in acute chest syndrome specifically. So the fact that patients have sickle cell disease alone, as you see there in terms of lifetime incidence, so cumulative lifetime incidence of PE, in the general population it's quoted about 8% in the literature. For sickle cell disease patients it's about 18.1%, okay, so more than double. In addition to that, specifically in acute chest syndrome, when they present 
studies range in terms of the actual sort of proportion that have PEs associated, but it's quoted anywhere from sort of 11 to 16 percent. Now, when we approach these patients and we're trying to diagnose a PE, if we're concerned clinically that they have a PE, we have to change our diagnostic approach. So there's an important point to the fact that risk scores like the Wells, the Geneva that we use to risk stratify patients have never been validated in sickle cell disease. And in addition to that, there was a study published this year. The goal of the study was to derive its own risk score, but it also double-checked and see, and to see if the Geneva score was applicable. And essentially, they said it was unreliable. Unfortunately, the Wells wasn't tested in this cohort. In addition to that, there's been multitudes of studies showing a strong association between patients just having sickle cell disease and chronically having elevated levels of D-dimers, or always positive D-dimers. So with that respect, risk stratification isn't really appropriate for these patients, and D-dimers really, are never really indicated for these patients. So if you're concerned about PE, then you go right to imaging. Okay? Um, so really quickly, we'll touch on the treatment of acute chest syndrome. Really, the cornerstones for these patients is going to be oxygen, antibiotics, admission, and then this decision that we'll make in consultation with our hematology colleagues between simple and exchange transfusions. So as we chatted about, they do have a large predominance of atypical organisms, but are also at risk for encapsulated bacteria. So the guidelines currently recommend that all patients presenting with acute chest syndrome get a cephalosporin, so an IV cephalosporin, and then a PO macrolide. Local hematology practice is also to consider adding coverage for resistant strep pneumo species, so adding on something like IV vanco. Um, unfortunately, it's not echoed in the, uh, in the guidelines currently, but it is local practice to consider that. In terms of uh, exchange versus simple transfusion, it's a little bit out of, I don't know about you guys, it's a little bit out of my wheelhouse. Um, and there's conflicting evidence between the two regarding benefits and effect on length of stay and outcomes and things like that. This is what the guidelines recommend. So currently, simple transfusion, transfusions essentially are indicated in acute chest syndrome patients who have a drop in hemoglobin of about 10%. This is what the guidelines say. Exchange transfusions essentially are reserved for sicker patients. So patients who present with either rapidly progressing acute chest syndrome or patients who fail simple transfusion. In either case, we should be consulting our hematology colleagues before making any transfusion decisions. Now, I wanted to take a, a minute or two just as a quick aside about considering exchange transfusions in all sickle cell disease patients who present to the department with serious sequelae. So patients who present with stroke, with sequestration, or any other severe sort of end organ dysfunction or end organ damage, we should be considering whether or not this patient is appropriate for consideration of exchange transfusion, and it's reasonable to involve our hematology colleagues just to give them a call to make sure it's not indicated. Um, so really quickly chat about uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation for these patients. Um, there was a, a relatively small pilot study that was published in uh, intensive care medicine in 2010, which looked at whether or not something like CPAP or BiPAP is helpful for these patients. Um, this is sort of the best data that we have, so bear with me. Um, 67 adult patients admitted with 71 episodes of acute chest syndrome, and essentially they divided them up into two cohorts. One cohort got CPAP or BiPAP for three days. The other just got traditional oxygen therapy. And they looked at a couple outcomes. The first one was physiologic outcomes. The next was more patient-oriented outcomes. So in terms of physiologic parameters, what they showed was that initially, anyway, it was associated with non-invasive positive pressure ventilation was associated with lowered respiratory rate, maybe improvement in the AA gradient. But it did not significantly improve patient-oriented stuff, like length of stay, pain relief, transfusion requirements. So no real meaningful conclusions that we can make from that study. So as a quick recap to acute chest syndrome, when should we be worried about it? Effectively, when patients with sickle cell disease present with signs and symptoms consistent with pneumonia. Consider PE in all these patients. And if you're concerned clinically that they have a PE, you should consider imaging. Cover for atypicals with antibiotics, as well as encapsulated organisms like we talked about. Maintain normal oxia and involve hematology early for admission and to initiate possible simple versus exchange transfusion.
So let's go back to, uh, to Vidi. And essentially, so we made our diagnosis of acute chest syndrome. You treat him quickly with IV ceftriaxone. You give him a PO azithro. Uh, you supplement his O2, and you give hematology a quick call and let him know that you're concerned about acute chest syndrome. And they come down and they institute rapid uh, exchange transfusion for this young guy. Okay? Um, so that's it for today. So again, I wanted to uh, express my thanks, my gratitude to uh, Dr. Yadav, uh, to Drs. Tupan and Tinmouth, uh, to Dr. Miller and uh, my better half, Jenna, as well. So happy to take uh, any questions. This is my, I don't have any kids or, or current pets, so this is uh, Longbottom, my guinea pig from uh, my childhood. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha